pleasure to introduce Jeremy Stanley, who's the VP of Data Science at Instacart. Um, before Instacart, Jeremy was the Chief Data Scientist at Sailthrough and was also the CTO of Collective and founded the Global Markets Analytics Group at Ernst & Young. So please join me in welcoming Jeremy. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me today. So uh, I run data science at Instacart, and what I'm going to talk to you about today is three things. First, I'll give you a short introduction to data science at Instacart, so you know a little bit about what it is we do. But then the bulk of the talk, I'm going to spend talking about building data science teams. You know, what is data science? How do you recruit for it? How do you organize it? Um, so a couple of different, more uh, softer topics about the organization. And then I'm going to conclude with a little bit about ice cream. Why? Because ice cream is really tasty. You'll, you'll see at the end. So Instacart, uh, how many of you have used Instacart before? Okay, so a, a modest amount. My whole goal here is actually to convince the other half of you to try the service. That's really the only reason I'm here. So Instacart, we have a pretty straightforward value proposition. We deliver groceries from stores you already know and love in as little as an hour right to your doorstep. Sounds pretty simple, right? Well, so if you're a consumer and you haven't used the application before, what you do is you download the application. And the first thing you'll do is you'll select one of the retailers that we work with. It could be you know, Whole Foods or Costco, or if you're out here in the East Bay, maybe it's Berkeley Bowl. Once you go into that retailer, you start to shop for groceries. You search for things you already know and love. You look at recommendations we make. You buy things you've purchased in the past. You slowly build up a basket. You then go and check out and select a delivery time. And once that delivery time is selected, you'll wait for the personal shopper to go to the store. They'll show up at your doorstep, give you the groceries. You take all of the groceries out of the bags and you put them into your refrigerator or your pantry and then your pet crawls into the bag and you take a photo of your pet in the bag <laughs> and you put that photo on Twitter and you become famous. So that's, that's the end-to-end -end service experience. <laughs> You got, you got to do the pet in the bag thing. What you may not realize is that there is an equally and, and in fact more complex application behind the scenes that our personal shoppers use to make all of this happen. So if you're a personal shopper, you go on shift and you'll look at your application, you'll get a push notification that we have a batch ready for you to pick up. You'll acknowledge that batch, you'll drive to the store, you'll have say 50 items to pick at Berkeley Bowl and we'll show you the sequence that you ought to pick those items in. As you grab an item, you'll scan the barcode to make sure that you have the exact right you know, flavor and fat content of Greek yogurt that the customer wanted. You then go out for delivery, drive to the customer's address, and then you know, the whole thing with the pet in the bag, that happens again. It's critical. So behind the scenes, uh, Instacart's complex in part because it's got many sides to the business model. There's the two sides that I've just talked about. Uh, on one side, we have the customers themselves. On the other side, we have the personal shoppers, right? They're shopping and communicating for each other. But there's also the stores themselves, all of our retail partners. We have 160 different retail partners around the nation. They have tens of thousands of store locations. So all of those store locations, we need to shop out of them, which means we need to understand their layout and where the items belong and how much inventory there is on the shelves. All of those retailers also have brands. They're trying to attract customers, and they're trying to you know, make that inventory available and create special discounts and relationships with those customers. And then on the other side, we have the products themselves and the consumer packaged goods companies, the Procter & Gamble's, et cetera, behind those products that really want to advertise to all of these users. And we have to help our shoppers find those specific products on the store shelves. So really, I think data science is more complex at Instacart, and there's more surface area and opportunity because of these four sides. You know, every one of those pairs presents an opportunity for measurement of data, for influence, uh, for multiple competing objectives. So what are the things that we do at Instacart? Uh, a couple of them. For example, we're predicting the times it takes to actually pick all of the groceries, to drive to the store, to make the delivery, because we're trying to do this in a sequence, and we have to make sure that the fourth delivery is due on time. We're looking at the entire network of shoppers that we have, uh, multiple different role types, some just in the store, some picking up groceries that are staged and delivering them, right? Thousands of different shoppers, many thousands of different orders, 
What's the optimal routing and assignment to be able to move as fast as possible and make sure that everything's delivered on time? So that's a big challenge. And then there's everything that you need to do on the consumer side of the application. For example, this is me shopping for groceries from my buy it again list. We've got machine learning models sitting behind that data, predicting the chance that I'm going to buy any one of the items I've purchased in the past and sorting that list for me when I show up so I can shop for my groceries in as little as a minute. Okay, so that's Instacart. Let's talk about building data science teams. This is a nice Western kind of view. This is everything we don't know <laughs> about building data science teams, right? This is pretty new. We've been building engineering teams for a while. There's still a lot to be learned about how to do that effectively. Data science is a relatively new discipline. Uh, this is me in the back, not really me, but you know, kind of metaphorically me. Uh, <laughs> And these are people that are smarter than me that I'm kind of following, right? And hoping they're going to lead me to water. They're uh, people at companies like Facebook and Airbnb, Spotify, uh, LinkedIn, Netflix. I've talked to a lot of different leaders over the last decade about how they build and organize teams and have tried to learn from them. And so I hope I can pass some of these lessons on to all of you. So the first thing I like to start with is what is data science? And I actually really like this uh, distinction. Data science is more about what your objective is. Uh, than what your skill sets are. Uh, so the two primary objectives I see in data science, one of them is what I call uh, data products. Data products are very mission driven. You have some long-term objective and goal you're trying to accomplish. And it's a really tight collaboration with your engineering organization. And you're going through a process like this. You start out with an MVP product, something that probably has no data science in it, right? It's something very naive and simple. It's collecting data. You get market fit, you start to get scale, you start to get the usage data of that product. You then can apply machine learning onto that usage data. You can do A-B tests critically, right? Because machine learning in a vacuum doesn't actually tell you if the product's gonna get any better. You have to ship a change and do an A-B test to be sure. And that leads to an improved product, oftentimes to improved data collection in a very virtuous cycle where the product gets better over time. Contrast that with what I call decision science where it's really question driven. You're trying to help someone make a better decision. And it's a collaboration with leadership. It could be the product management leadership, the engineering leadership, it could be operations or executive leadership. And there the workflow is more like you have some complication, some question, some opportunity that presents itself. You do data collection or have been doing data collection associated with that. You perform an analysis, you produce visualizations, right? Visualizations can convey far richer meaning about data uh, than anything else. You communicate those visualizations, you probably iterate a lot, right? Refining your assumptions, collecting additional data, building more complex models, and ultimately, you derive a decision. And that's the end objective. So whenever I interview data scientists, my favorite thing to ask them is, which of these do you prefer to do? Well, which of these do you feel you're better at? And I would say probably two thirds of the time, there's a pretty clear delineation. Some people really do like to do both, but by and large, people will self-select into one or the other. So to give you an example, let's talk about personalization at Instacart. You can start uh, the Instacart application with no real data science. You just need to have a catalog. You need to have some search infrastructure associated with that catalog, something like Elasticsearch, a simple search interface. You need to log what people buy and present to them buy it again. And that can be you know, just ranked by recency or frequency of their purchase. You can then get millions of purchases. You can get all of the baskets and all of those purchases. And you can start to apply machine learning. Say you use Spark, you do collaborative filtering as your first version of this. You release a change that now ranks the products in a more intelligent order, personalized to the user. You do an A-B test, you find that basket sizes actually go up. And you declare success, and the cycle continues. And you end up with a much improved product that can make personalized recommendations, that can improve how people shop with data. Let's talk about the decision science. Suppose we're considering growth and we're looking at a cohort of users that for whatever reason, their behavior has been trending downward over time. It presents some sort of a crux. There's something happening in the business that is concerning. So you do a whole bunch of data collection, maybe multiple years of data, hundreds of different variables. You might use a tool like R, do lots of different visualization to try to tease out right, correlation and causality uh, and uh, you know, other changes that might have influenced this cohort. You do lots of different communication and you make maybe a number of different decisions. Maybe you change the type of 
customer you're acquiring. Maybe you change the product roadmap. You come up with A-B test ideas for new features that might address the needs of this cohort. Maybe you change pricing or you change how you focus on quality. Maybe you change how you appease quality issues, right? There could be many different things that you might change in the business that are gonna be informed by an analysis of why that trend went down into the right over time. So when do you build data science into a startup? I think it's a question I get asked a lot. And I think there are three key things. So the first one is you have to have commitment. You know, the organization has to be data driven. They have to be willing to make decisions not based upon the highest paid person in the room, but based upon data. And if that's something that everyone in the organization fundamentally buys into, I think that that's a really you know, fantastic accelerator. You need to have opportunities to really personalize your product or optimize your product. Right? Those are gonna be opportunities for machine learning and for data products. The second is you have to have data. Uh, you have to have an MVP. You know, I think it's uh, naive to add a data scientist before you've shipped a product. Uh, you can almost always ship a version one of a product and start to collect data. And only then will you actually have something that's gonna meaningfully drive the product forward. You also have to have control. If you're in an industry where all you are doing is observing the data, at best you can provide data derivative products. Uh, ideally, you can actually control and influence what your users are doing. And then obviously you need to have signal. It's not enough to have billions of log events of you know, ad impressions. If none of those ad impressions are viewed, uh, it doesn't really matter, right? So you have to have real meaningful signal in the data, not just the size. And then finally, I think it has to be core to the business. It has to be something that's critical to the success of the business. It has to be novel. If it's not novel, if it's something that every company needs to do, you can oftentimes just use a third party uh, service provider. And then finally, it has to be impactful, meaning that whatever you ship or however you use data science has to move business metrics in a meaningful way. So how do you organize data science? Uh, this is an open question still, and I'll present three different ways of organizing data science teams. So the first way, and kind of the classical way of doing it is the standalone data science team. They all report to one data science leader centrally, and they will consult you know, with different parts of the business, right? Different parts of the engineering organization whenever there's a specific problem that they can solve. So the strength of this is it's very autonomous. That team can do whatever it is they want. They can build whatever team they want, use whatever tools they want, but that autonomy is their downfall because they can be very easily marginalized, right? They are constantly reliant upon selling their services into other parts of the business, and those other parts of the business may operate in completely different cycles, and you end up in the situation where you hand a data product from one organization to another, and the other organization says, I don't understand it, I'm not gonna use it, it's not gonna scale, uh, and it just slows everything down. The next organization is embedded, where all of the data scientists still report into one centralized leader, but they are uh, dedicated to specific parts of the business. You have a data scientist who's dedicated to marketing, and they may sit with the marketing team part of the time and sit with the data science team part of the time. And so the nice thing about this is it really gives you flexibility, but the challenge is those people will often still be missing context because they're not completely integrated into the team. They may not be there when the product roadmap decisions are being made. They may not be there when the logging decisions are being made about the product, you know, dictating what's gonna be collected in the future and how much of an impact they're going to be able to have. So the final organizational model is what I call integrated. This one is really mission driven. And it's where the data scientists literally sit side by side with the engineers and report to the same technical leader. So this is how Instacart organizes around the data products. On the analytics and decision science side, we are more of an embedded model. So the great thing about integrated is that it drives ownership. The ability to get things done is the highest priority in a startup like Instacart. And so making sure there are no barriers to that, that the data scientists and the engineers can ship a change to a product in a day and it's completely seamless. And that's kind of the thing that you're organizing and optimizing for is really important. The big weakness is, one of them is, you've, how do you go from zero to one? We've got about 25 different teams, not all of whom need to have an integrated machine learning engineer. Uh, and yet some of them may have uh, opportunities for that. And so you have to either add them too early or add them too late. One of the other challenges is how do you build an organization? How do you bring them all together? It turns out that that's actually my job at Instacart is to help uh, organize all of these people across their integrated teams. 
What does it look like as the organization size scales? I think this is the key driver of how these things change, and it makes sense when you, when you go through it. So let's look at data products first. If your startup has one to five engineers, what you're really looking for is advice. Uh, you don't wanna have anybody on the team. Uh, you wanna have somebody you can talk to and make smart decisions about your MVP, about your data infrastructure and your logging. You wanna be focused on getting something stupid to market fast. So you can hire data scientists later to make it intelligent, right? Don't put the cart before the horse. When you've got 60 to 20 engineers, clearly you've got a market a product out, you've got a, a fit with a bunch of consumers, and I think the embedded model makes a lot of sense. You really don't have the scale yet to justify integrating data scientists into multiple teams, so you'll have one or two that all report centrally and consult around the organization with different problems. And then you can move to the full integrated model once you go from 20 to 100. When you get past 100, I start to see organizations building what we call platform teams. So these are teams whose sole purpose is some data science component of you know, the infrastructure or service. Maybe they're just building a recommendation system. And they've got engineers, and they've got machine learning engineers, but it's really viewed as a platform, a service that other parts of the organization will rely upon. On the decision science, I think if you're one to five engineers, the decision scientist is you. You know, whoever you are, right? It has to be everyone in the organization uh, looking at the data, using the data to make as good a decisions as can possibly be made. I think standalone works really well, you know, six to 20. One person can cover multiple different topics within the organization, and then embedded scales really well up to 100. You've got different people focused on different topics for years, perhaps at a time, you know, building context and understanding. I really don't know what you do when you get to 101 engineers, it's like a puppy mosh pit. I think you have to start to abolish the notion of a centralized team altogether, and it becomes distributed entirely within the organization. So how does Instacart organize? I've kind of told you a little bit about this. We've got a whole bunch of different teams behind the scenes that focus on different parts of what we do. And they own that end to end. There's a team that owns the fulfillment algorithm end to end a team that owns the shopper application end-to-end, -end, or the search and discovery interfaces end-to-end. -end. All of those teams are integrated, so they'll have designers, they'll have full stack engineers and mobile engineers, they'll have machine learning engineers and you know, decision scientists, all working together for a common goal and an open code base. And then every once in a while we form what we call working groups uh, these span multiple different teams, and it's when we have something strategically we have to drive that doesn't nicely fit into one or two of these mission-driven teams. And the key there is to make those very empowered and to dissolve them. Uh, if they're lasting longer than a quarter, it probably means your organizational model is broken or you're not fixing the root issues, uh, right? Otherwise, uh, why would you keep these cross-team groups? Okay, let's talk about hiring. So first, for hiring, a few principles. The first one is, I really believe you have to build an engine. And this is fundamental. If you're gonna build a data science team, you, you've gotta convince your CEO, you know, your head of finance, that, that you should build an engine. Uh, because it's expensive. Now why do you build an engine? It's because you don't find talent. I have almost never gone out and said, you, come work for me, right? It just it doesn't work that way. Talent shows up, and it's a random process, right? Poisson distributed and you wanna be there waiting for them you know, with an opportunity in hand when they happen to show up. Uh, and so if you build an engine and it's always on, you'll be there when the talent arrives. And that is far more efficient than thinking you can turn a spigot on and then turn it off and then turn it on and then turn it off. Make the objective part of the evaluation first and make it as automated as possible. You have to evaluate candidates for their technical skills you can do that with you know, take-home challenges. You can do it with straightforward on-site exercises. Uh, and you can make it more complex as they get deeper into the process. And then you can evaluate you know, culture fit, where they, would, where they would reside in the organization. Those evaluations are the most fraught with bias. So you want to push them back in the process and convince yourself up front that this is a very talented person before you give yourself an opportunity to say they won't fit here. They're also the most expensive. A lot of the technical things can be done in an automated fashion up front, and so you can do them at scale and you can open yourself to the world. Anybody can apply for a data science job at Instacart, we'll give them a challenge, because it doesn't cost us that much to evaluate. And then finally, optimize for the experience the candidate has. I think that that's uh, far better than selling them. 
And so if you can design the experience, the challenge, the data, the people they meet with, uh, the opportunities they have to meet with your leadership, your CEO, your board members, right? Those experiences are, are gonna sell them far more than you telling them about how great the organization is. So what are our goals? I think it's interesting to try to put quantitative metrics around hiring. We are, after all, data scientists. So I'll explain what those are, you know, somewhat aspirationally. Uh, the first one is accuracy. We want 90% of the people that we hire to be exceptional. You know, if I go back early in my career as a manager, if I was just asking people questions and using that as the basis of hiring, I was probably right 60% of the time. Uh, I wanna have a process that's much better than that. It should be 90% of the time. We wanna make sure we don't lose people. It's okay to, you can imagine having a process that's just very, very selective and difficult, and you get 90% you know, of the time you hire people, you're right, but the majority of the great people never make it through that process, it's too onerous. So you wanna make the process such that it can get 80% of the great candidates all the way through the funnel. You wanna make sure that your offers are accepted. I aim to have two thirds of the offers accepted by candidates. That means you know, almost always we're competing against others, Google, Netflix, you know, other startups. Um, and so you're not gonna win them all. Uh, but if I can win two thirds of them, I feel really good about what we're doing. I wanna make sure that it doesn't consume the team's time, that we don't stop doing data science and become a full-time hiring and recruiting team. So it should be less than 10% of the team's time on an ongoing basis. And then diversity. I really wanna make sure that candidates can make it through any step of the pro uh, process uh, and that that is independent. The probability of doing that is independent of their gender, their ethnicity, their age, right? Things that don't really matter uh, you know, for their ability to contribute to the organization. Uh, so this is critical to ultimately build a diverse team. What does the process look like? It starts with a pre-screen. Uh, this is checking for a pulse. Uh, a lot of people's pre-screen is, did they go to the right university? Do they have the right number of years of experience? Ours is not that. Ours is, are they a human? Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, you can take the take-home test. Robots cannot, not yet. Um, and really the take home test is to test for sufficient skill. It's not meant to be the end all be all of their technical aptitude. It's meant to justify continued investment. We then bring them on site and to get them on site, sometimes we have to do a sales pitch and we typically do that anyways to try to convince them that they should invest their energy and effort in coming to Instacart. Uh, and then on site, we do something like a day to day. You know, we try to test uh, their expertise in as realistic and controlled an environment as possible and evaluate their culture fit. We then make a really quick decision. We try to make the decision that evening or the next day at the latest and get back to all of the candidates as quickly as we can. What do we look for in terms of technical skills? There's, I think, four big things. Uh, the first one is problem structuring. Uh, we're an applied shop. Uh, we're dealing in a very dynamic you know, uh, evolving business model and marketplace. You need to be able to take a very complex problem and structure it. What's the real objective? How would you measure it, right? How do you link the algorithms and the data to the business? There's the technical rigor, you know, is what they do reliable? Is their code readable? You know, will their implementations be flexible? There's their analytical rigor, uh, their thinking, right? Is it logically sound and is it complete? Are they addressing the whole problem? And then finally, communication. Uh, you have to be able to sell your ideas. You have to be able to uh, collaborate with your peers. Um, and so being able to clearly describe your work and be sharp in Q&A is something that we you know, closely look for. Two minutes, almost there. So a little bit on culture. I see three different types of cultures. One where the teams are being pulled in lots of different directions because there's insufficient infrastructure, not enough guidance. I see teams where they're really fun, but not very productive. And the reason is they're not working on the right problem that's core to the mission of the business, or maybe there's too many data scientists and not enough engineers. And then there's the teams where they really feel like they have superpowers, where everything's just clicking. They've got all the tools and the infrastructure, and they can get a lot of stuff done, and they're really recognized for the impact. So some of the ways that we get there at Instacart, we really try to democratize data and learning around it. Uh, we've got something called Blazor that makes SQL access to production data accessible to everybody in the company. We do SQL classes. Uh, we do introduction to statistical learning. We've got a process for moving engineers into machine learning over the course of a year. We do demos uh, and what we call lunch and discuss uh, every week where we're you know, learning from each other and from the outside world. I've written about a lot of this stuff. You can go to uh, First Round Review and I've written a couple of articles there or the Instacart tech blog. 
Last but not least, ice cream. We've open sourced three million uh, Instacart orders. And so you get every order, the time of day, the day of week, the products in those orders, the sequence that those orders were added to cart. Uh, and if you look at this data, one of the fun things you can look at is what were the products ordered latest in the day and what were the products er ordered earliest in the day? And the earliest in the day products are things like half and half for coffee, you know, uh, zero calorie soda, uh, dry roasted almonds, oranges, almond milk, almond cereal, aspirational, healthy foods. <laughs> and then there's the stuff that, you know, uh, students at Berkeley order <laughs> in the evening, which I don't know if you can read this, <laughs> but the first 24 are ice cream. <laughs> and uh, the 25th one is pizza, fro frozen pizza. <laughs> Uh, so this is a really fun data set. It's open sourced. You can go to our tech blog. You can download it from S3. You can use it for any non-commercial application. We may or may not do a machine learning competition associated with it. Uh, I'll leave you with this note. Uh, Mario Andretti said, if everything's under control, you're not going fast enough. Uh, that is the mantra of being in tech in a startup. You've got to live and breathe that and feel comfortable with it. Um, and we're hiring. You can follow me on Twitter at Jeremy Stan. Uh, you can send me an email at jeremy.stanley at instacart.com or go to our careers site. That's it. Thanks so much. Hi. That was a great talk, by the way. Thanks. Um, my question to you is, um, Essentially, most of the stuff you talked about, uh, kind of pivoting on a dime, kind of mantra, right? So pivoting on a dime, like yeah. moving, uh, reacting very fast. That's very much applicable to the Bay Area or tech-savvy companies. Yeah. I think the bigger challenge in terms of building a team is there for the brick and mortar companies who basically, they take time, they basically size the market, they size the potential, yeah. and the same thing that happened in the internet age, right? They basically waited for some time. Now Walmart.com is trying to take on Amazon and things like that. What do you advise to such companies? Because most of these companies have a kind of knee-jerk reaction. They see that, okay, data science is hot. Yeah. Just go and hire a bunch of people and then put them in the team. So I think one of the challenges is, like, do they belong in the IT or they should be a separate stream altogether because of the yeah. way IT operates in big companies? And I'm talking with respect to the brick and mortar companies. I'm not talking yeah. with respect to like company like Instacart because you are in tune with the things, right? Yeah. How do you okay. advise okay. such companies? Okay, we got yeah, I think question. I got it. Thank you. So yeah. I think that the, the typical model is to build essentially a standalone team. Maybe it's integrated into IT or maybe it's separate reports to the CEO and you have all of the problems of a standalone team. You know, they're going to build things and it's not actually going to be used. And so I think that those companies have a choice. They can either make the organizational changes to really try to change and reshape how they build products, you know, how they enter new markets, how they make decisions. And data science is an integral part of that, but it's just a piece. They've got to change the talent that they're looking for. They've got to change how they organize. And then, then I think they can reap many of the rewards. If they don't have that, what I see some big companies doing is creating like implementation roles who's, you know, people that are really just tasked and measured on their ability to put the things that are created into production and be the go-between between, between the IT department and the business unit that needs to use it. You know, that's going to make things, you know, five times slower, three times more expensive. It's going to make the learning rate lossy, but it's better than just investing a bunch of money in IT and having it do nothing. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's take the question, of, yeah, just next door. Thank you. Um, so you, you talked about how your initial candidate screening process is to get as many interested individuals to take the actual technical challenge as possible, just to check to see if they have a pulse first. Yeah. Do you think that's more of a reflection of the size of your company or the belief? So yeah. does that ability get limited as the company gets larger? Do you think the ability to let everyone do that is I diminished? Don't, I don't think so. I think it's limited by um, you know, how automated you can make the process. And so if the uh, distribution and access to the challenge is fairly automated, if the evaluation can begin automated and then become more manual as you get kind of confirmation, you know, and you can involve multiple different people only once one person is vetted initially, then I think it becomes pretty scalable. 
I'll say the one thing that I change about this is if I've got somebody who has you know, five or 10 years of experience, something that's very relevant, I won't ask them to take the challenge before I talk to them. Uh, I may not ask them to take the challenge until halfway through the process. Everybody takes the challenge eventually, but if somebody comes in with a lot of experience and they're interviewing at five places, I don't want to gate them on doing a challenge. You know, that, that wouldn't make sense. Uh, but I'll tell you, I did the challenge when I joined Instacart. Um, so it is something I want everyone to do. Okay. Let's take a, uh, okay, we'll take one final question uh, just here. Yes, thank you. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Hi, my name is Priya, and I had a question about scaling data scientist teams. So I understand that as the company grows and products grow and you have different data scientist teams, but do you ever hit a cap in a data science team where you start having diminishing returns? Like how much is too much with scale, scaling within a team? Yeah, so I think that's a, that's a great question. Uh, as I look across teams, you've got to ask first, um, how big can a team be? Uh, and I don't think teams can be that effective much past 10 people, right? This is a common engineering, you know, kind of technology wisdom, the two pizza rule. If you can't feed the team with two pizzas, uh, it's too big. Uh, so, you know, this is a, uh, it's kind of mirrors like the family unit, right? Like a family that's more than 10 people. I don't know, that's kind of crazy. Uh, no, no judgment, but that would be tough for me. Um, so, so that, the first one is like, how big is the team? Uh, the second one is what is the composition of uh, people doing you know, data science or machine learning within that team? And some teams it can be zero. Uh, some teams it can be you know, one person. I think that's risky. If you have only one person doing the work, they're in a vacuum. So I like to have at least two. Uh, and in some cases, it might be two thirds of the team if the majority of what that team is doing is based in algorithms and based in data-driven products and decisions. Uh, and so from that perspective, as you grow, you have to take teams that maybe before you had one team doing search and discovery, and eventually you split that into a team that's doing search and a team that's doing discovery. And then you create another team that's doing ads. Um, and the composition of data science within those teams you know, varies from 0% to you know, say 70%. Cool, all right. Great. Well, um, thanks very much. I apologize for uh, anyone who didn't get a question and we've got a lot to cover. Jeremy, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.